Cholinergic pharmacology basically looks at the effect of acetylcholine in our body. It will be important to realize that acetylcholine plays a role at two different synapses in the ANS. The preganglionic synapse, which is identical in both parasympathetic and sympathetic, where acetylcholine will bind to nicotinic receptors, and the postganglionic synapse, where acetylcholine in the parasympathetic nervous system bind exclusively to muscarinic type of receptors. At the same time, we will digress and look at acetylcholine's effect at the neuromuscular junction of our skeletal muscle, where their acetylcholine will bind to nicotinic muscle type of receptors. Once we know well what muscarinic and nicotinic responses are in the body, and to this effect, we've built big tables for you to use. Only once you know these tables, then go and learn the names of agonist and blockers of these receptors. The general approach of pharmacology should not be one that looks first at the name of a drug and lists under the drug all the things you should know about it. That's flashcard. That is something you could do as a re-review for yourself afterwards. Rather, the approach to a good review of pharmacology and a sound understanding of our drugs is first to review all the physiopaths and biochem that's associated with those receptors. This will be our first step. There is a general concept also in this chapter that you'll carry out throughout the book, which is the concept of being a direct acting drug versus being indirect acting. You see, a direct acting drug is a drug that binds to receptors, and whether a neurotransmitter is present or not, the mere fact that that drug binding to its receptor will result in some responses. You contrast. When we're looking at an indirect acting drug, this will be a drug that works through the presence of the actual neurotransmitter. In chapter 4, an example of indirect acting agonist would be the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, very important group of drugs. You'll contrast those to direct acting agonists and blockers of the muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Well, we're about to start conventional pharmacology and seeing drugs. How should you approach looking at drugs? Uh, you know, often we hate farm at first. Number one, it smells bad because we raise pigs. Oh, no, no, that's a different farm. But, you know, number one, there are thousands of drugs out there. So how am I going to sort out all these drugs? Look, there's a classic way that we tend to first try and stick to. And let me tell you, it does not work. You don't learn pharmacology by first working with a drug name at the top of the page and writing under that drug name everything about that one drug. Because you'll start the first drug. I defy you to go beyond 20 drugs before you start confusing everything. The proper approach to pharmacology is not to start with a drug name. It's to do most of your work on a good and clever understanding of the system you're about to affect with a drug. So there is one thing that your board will force you to have as an approach, which is that of the site of action of the drug. You'll see that every chapter in our book is going to generally have a nice figure that shows you a process you're about to interfere with using drugs and will show you the potential site of action of these medications without dwelling into what we're going to use that drug for and so forth, so that you have a visual of what you're about to do with the drug. Understanding this process will be laying the foundation for understanding what the drug effects, side effects, potential indications or contraindications will be. Now, this said, at the end of each chapter, you'll see that I built some drug lists for you. These drug lists actually have all of the important drugs you must know written in red. These are drugs that you will have to commit to memory before you take your boards. Now, the drugs that will be spelled in black in those lists at the end of each chapter of the book, it would be great if you knew them too. But let's face it, we can't know every single name of drug. And if we're lucky, there might be a certain trend in those names that easily put them into a class of drug. But this said, you're going to have to limit initially your memorization to at least the red drugs. It is generally those drugs that we'll use as examples on those cycle action diagram. Now, I'm about to look at acetylcholine, its receptors, and the drugs that work there. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, so my site of action will be represented by a diagram of a synapse. And this synapse is a synapse of a cholinergic neuron with its effector cell, whichever that effector cell might be. Recall, it could be a smooth muscle, it could be a heart, it could be a gland. Cholinergic neuron, first, the presynaptic nerve terminal has to have built acetylcholine. The pathways, the biochemical cascade that builds neurotransmitter is USMLE step one relevant. To make acetylcholine, it's not too tough. We'll need some acetylcholine A. I will remind you from biochem that acetylcholine can only come from burning glucose, since we can't burn fat up in the CNS. And acetylcholine is combined with choline, a specialized amino acid, with the enzyme choline acetyltransferase. Now, in order to control the amount of neurotransmitter that's released in a synapse, our nerves have vesicle, and these vesicles are where the drug is trapped. Now, acetylcholine packaged into vesicle can only be released if the process of exocytosis is initiated. And to initiate exocytosis of any neurotransmitter, it's a several-step process that will first require depolarization of the nerve terminal. This is mediated by voltage-dependent channels, if you recall, in physiology. Second, that depolarization of the nerve terminal, importantly, will result in calcium entry. And that calcium entry, number three, will initiate the neurotransmitter release, NT for neurotransmitter. This is what is represented in that presynaptic cholinergic neuron. Let's imagine exocytosis has occurred. Now acetylcholine is in the synapse. What is acetylcholine going to do? It's going to find receptors to bind to. Receptors are subdivided in two broad types to acetylcholine. Muscarinic receptors, for which we describe five subtypes, labeled M1 through M5. You see that the diagram represents a snake-like protein spanning the membrane seven times. All muscarinic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. Or alternatively, acetylcholine will bind to nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors comprise two broad types, the nicotinic neuronal type NN or the nicotinic muscle type NM. The diagram is trying to represent an ion channel. And nicotinic receptors will be ion channels, so that acetylcholine binds to either G-protein coupled receptors or to ligand dating ion channels. Where are these receptors located? Most of the receptors we're excited about are on the effector cell, the effector cell being downstream from the synapse. These are referred to as postsynaptic receptors. But we would be fooled not to realize that similar receptors also exist on the presynaptic nerve ending. And presynaptic receptors are relevantly going to be involved in acetylcholine controlling its own synthesis and release, so that quite often these receptors are involved in negative and positive feedback. Well, we're not seeing any specific subtypes at this point for acetylcholine. How do I stop the effect of neurotransmission when it comes to acetylcholine? Well, a key point of acetylcholine is that it is not uptaken to be recycled. Acetylcholine is exclusively degraded in the synapse by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, or ACHE on your diagram. It is broken down to its two initial components, acetate, which will be reused, 
and choline. Choline, in turn, if you follow the arrow, is the one that is reuptaken by the cholinergic neuron. It is reuptaken by a sodium choline co-transporter. And that sodium choline co-transporter, very classic of physio, is a secondary active transport that depends on sodium potassium ATPase pump in order to allow choline to come in. So here we go. You've described the acetylcholine synapse. Now, where do I have drugs in that synapse? So as we look at drugs and how they interfere with that synaptic arrangement for acetylcholine, one important aspect of drugs is where on this synapse are they going to work? And one thing I want you to understand as a generality is that there are two broad types of drugs. The ones that work in the blue box are the drugs that work on the presynaptic nerve ending. The ones that work in the red box are the ones that work at the effector cell level. Working at the effector cell level means agonists or blockers of nicotinic or muscarinic receptor may stimulate or block respectively that effector cell function. Well, that's what we call a direct acting drug. We call that drug direct acting simply because irrespective of the presence of a presynaptic nerve terminal, irrespective of the presence of acetylcholine itself in the synapse, these are drugs that will cause a response when they bind to a receptor of their agonists or block a response if they bind to the receptors and their antagonists. Contrast then the drugs that would work in the blue box. In the blue box, the effect of these drugs is all indirect. So we call these drugs indirect acting. Indirect acting drugs will always depend on the presence of a nerve terminal and the presence of acetylcholine in a synapse to show their pharmacology. One big group of indirect acting drugs we'll work with are what we call the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Imagine this. You're a drug that blocks the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. If I block acetylcholine esterase on this diagram, I'm preventing the degradation of acetylcholine. So in turn, acetylcholine builds up in that synapse. And as it builds up, I expect the excess acetylcholine indirectly to overstimulate both nicotinic and muscarinic receptors on the effector cell. It's really not the drug itself that does the response. It is acetylcholine that is no longer degraded that does the response. The drug did not work on the receptor. It worked on the acetylcholine esterase itself that would have broken down acetylcholine. So it is indirect acting. Now, there are other ways of being indirect acting and alter the levels of acetylcholine. If you see those on your exam, as I always love to say, smack the exam for me. Don't hurt yourself, but smack the exam because they would be so poorly relevant. However, they've been on step one, particularly on those site of action question. Hemicolinium sounds like choline, but it sounds like half a choline. And hemicolinium actually can block choline uptake. If you block choline uptake, less choline in the cholinergic neuron means down the road less acetylcholine. If you have less acetylcholine to be released, there would be indirectly less stimulation of muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. It's more of a research drug than anything. The semicol on your diagram actually blocks the uptake of acetylcholine inside the synaptic vesicle. If you have empty synaptic vesicles, you have no acetylcholine to release, so indirectly you prevent stimulation of nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. Now, whereas these two drugs don't have much clinical relevance, just a step one relevance for site and mechanism of action, notice then that botulinum toxin is also part of this diagram. And botulinum toxin, more specifically, prevents the exocytosis of acetylcholine. So once again, lowering acetylcholine release lowers the levels of the neurotransmitter in the synapse, less acetylcholine in the synapse, less muscarinic and nicotinic stimulation. So our chapter is primarily going to focus on agonist and blockers that are direct acting and acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. But nonetheless, below the cholinergic synapse figure, you will try and commit to memory for your exam only, certainly not for hospital use, that choline uptake is blocked by hemicholinium. You will also potentially remember the semicol. I didn't even put it in the text just to show you how really, if you know this one, you know the icing on the cake. What I'm more excited about is as we turn our page and start looking at botulinum toxin, that would be quite relevant. But before I do, notice that for exocytosis to occur, not only we need calcium influx, but we also have the point that acetylcholine vesicles may contain other co-transmitters, that is including ATP, which is a precursor of adenosine. So adenosine is often co-localized with acetylcholine, or in certain portion of our body, particularly in the GI, VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide. Now, these are just to remind you that with parasympathetic responses can come other type of pharmacology simply because of co-localization in these vesicles of other neurotransmitters. It's relevant as an understanding for right now, but we won't talk about adenosine until later or VIP until later in the book. Huh? So let's look at this botulinum toxin into a little bit more detail. The diagram showed us that botulinum toxin prevented the release of acetylcholine. How does it do that? It does it by interacting with SNAP25. Every time you see S in here, it's for synaptic neuronal type of protein. SNAP25 is known as a type of snare protein. And these snare proteins are quite relevant for fusing the synaptic vesicle with the membrane. Now, botulinum toxin, by blocking these SNAP25 proteins, prevent, if you want, the tagging, the attachment of the vesicle with the membrane, so that then it prevents acetylcholine release. You know, if today we love SNAP25 as an example because it sounds so fancy, in effect, you might see an example of the snare protein as being the protein synaptobrevin. And synaptobrevin has also been used equally in both questions in pharmacology to express the mechanism of action of Botox. Now, if I prevent acetylcholine release, I know less acetylcholine will be present to stimulate receptors. And one little game we have to have right now is which receptor do you think is not stimulated when I'm saying I might use Botox for blepharospasm? Now, blepharospasm is the involuntary contraction of your eyelid. So an annoying twitching of that eyelid. If I say that I might, using, I might use it for strabismus, for dystonia, painful muscle contraction, potentially for achalasia, so lack of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, potentially preventing esophageal emptying into the stomach. You know, when I see all this that deals with too much muscle tone, it's clear to me that acetylcholine is not being released in order to decrease nicotinic M-type stimulation. So indirectly to prevent skeletal muscle type of nicotinic receptors. Now, what I want you to highlight very differently is the use of botulinum toxin on a board question for hyperhidrosis. Hyperhidrosis, too much sweating. 
And some people get upset because of too much sweating. I don't think it's because they might slip uh, going downstairs, fall and break their necks. It's probably more likely that they're really concerned because they don't smell so good. Which, by the way, between you and I, in France, we know what to do with that. We use nice cologne like Chanel and so forth. But if you want to use Botox, why not? Botox will decrease acetylcholine release and fight hyperhidrosis. That is, decreasing acetylcholine and its stimulation of muscarinic receptors. I didn't talk much about bruxism. Bruxism is the uncontrollable grinding of your teeth. It's bad if you suck your thumb, obviously. Uh, bruxism is also another indication for Botox. The one that really is not medical, but most commonly used for Botox is, of course, cosmetics. And you know that they are working on these nicotinic M type of receptors. So those muscle type, skeletal muscle type of receptors. The idea for Botox is to decrease wrinkling of the skin. Now, there is a big connection with Botox and microbiology. We do know that botulinum toxin is actually isolated from a species of Clostridia. So I would recommend you review your microbiology at this point and uh, remember that Clostridia, for instance, would be what? Gram positive or gram negative? I'm sure you're telling me that gram positive. Polycopsi, like staffs and strips, or rods? Their rods, yeah, just like Stuart. And as you look at these gram positive rods, well, you know that gram positive rods would like to know whether they're aerobic or anaerobes. And all Clostridia, just like Bacillus, are anaerobe and spore forming. And as they're spore forming, they also happen to have important toxins. If Clostridium botulinum has Botox, you remember that Clostridium tetani has tetanus toxin. So gram positive rods, anaerobes, spore forming. Yeah? Bacillus, gram positive rod, aerobe spore forming. And Clostridia, gram positive rods, anaerobes spore forming. That botulinum toxin is then isolated and very much used chemically. Now, in botulism itself, you have a complete shutdown of the ANS because of lack of ganglionic stimulation by acetylcholine. So there it's very different than the localized injection of Botox just where you want to see the effect. But very similar to what these indications are, you expect skeletal muscle of your patient to simply have no tone. And that paralysis of skeletal muscle will very much involve diaphragm, intercostal, scaling muscles, and compromise your patient's respiration, so that in botulism, there will be a potential for asphyxia. Now, before you asphyxiate and die from botulinum, the lack of ANS will clearly be associated with lack of modulation of vegetative responses, meaning your heart rate will be completely fixed. A little fast, but it can slow down if you rest. If you rest, it cannot increase if you exercise. Your pupils will be fixed. You can shine light. They cannot go myotic. They cannot go midriotic if you're in the dark. Obviously, fixed pupil <coughs> showing you lack of ANS. You put a stethoscope in your pa on your patient's belly, and you would uh, noticeably see, or hear, I should say, a lack of bowel sounds. So all these would be very classic of botulism. Well, botulinum Toxin, when it's used in pharmacology, must be carefully administered so as not to cause systemic type of effect. We'll never talk again about botulinum toxin. That's why I spend some time on it. And make sure then that what you would add to all this that we've seen in microbiology is the fact that it interacts with synaptobrevin such as SNAP25, a type of snare protein. And once you know this, you're on track with any questions about Botox. Now, as far as the major drugs in this chapter, since inactivation of acetylcholine occurs through acetylcholine esterase, it's going to be the target of inhibitory drugs that are indirect acting. These indirect acting cholinomimetics are going to be quite relevant as being reversible in most cases, such as hydrophonium, physostigmine, neostigmine, but possibly irreversible in the context of organophosphates, such as echothiophate, malathion, parathion. These are going to be quite important drugs for us to review. At the level of postsynaptic receptors, we'll discuss both agonists and antagonists. And remember, these drugs are coined as direct acting since they don't require the presence of a nerve terminal in order to cause an effect in the cell. Well, let's first explore muscarinic receptor pharmacology. Muscarinic receptors, they exist in five different flavors, labeled M1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All of them are G-protein coupled receptors, but I need to have an idea on my exam as to what type of G-proteins we're talking about. M1, 3, and 5 are G2 coupled. M2 and 4 are GI coupled. So if I wanted to test you on what happens at the signal transduction level, I would remember that M2 and M4 would lower cyclic AMP, and therefore lower protein kinase A, whereas M1, M3, or M5 stimulation would increase the production of IP3, vasoglycerol, and potential increase calcium levels inside the cell. How can I summarize the effect of muscarinic receptor activation? It's easy. Three poles. Muscarinic receptor stimulation will decrease cardiovascular function, increase all secretions, and increase smooth muscle contraction. So I'm looking at this. I'm starting to scratch my head. Maybe I mess up my nail in the process. But you tell me, to decrease cardiovascular function, to be inhibitory, what would you suggest to me is a kind of G-protein coupled receptor that could be inhibitory in nature? I'm hoping you're saying a GI coupled receptor, because you're absolutely correct. The cardiovascular inhibitory action of acetylcholine are primarily mediated by M2 receptors. And for all intents and purposes, M2 receptors for my boards, it's only going to be for the cardiac story. Everywhere else, we'll be excited primarily about M1 and M3. M4 and M5 are primarily in the CNS, and we're not going to talk much more about them beyond just knowing the G-protein coupling. So whereas the decreased cardiovascular function is selectively mediated by M2 stimulation, the secretion and smooth muscle contraction effect is primarily mediated by M1 or M3 GQ coupled type of receptors. We're in luck for this first section of conventional farm. Muscarinic receptor agonists and blockers are by far non-specific of the receptor subtype. It then means something critical for a board question and for farm. If I know well where muscarinic receptors are located and what they do for a living, I can absolutely identify all all the effects of blockers and activators of these receptors. Since they're not selective, the entire table will be happening when I use an agonist. The entire table will not happen when I use a blocker. It's just that simple. So what do you think it means about the table? I know what it means, right? It means you can't move forward and put names of drugs until you are absolutely convinced of what parasympathetic responses are expected to be. And if you remember sympathetic is for flight, flight, or fight, think parasympathetic is for the opposite, and that gets you started properly. Well, look, we'll start with something easy. The heart is very much innovated by parasympathetic. Anatomy tells me parasympathetic innovation by nerve 10 is very much 
to the SA and AV node. Notice, not the muscle. We're not saying atrial and ventricular muscle here. We're saying primarily nodal tissue. So the very tissue that controls the heart rate. Because the subtype of receptor is an M2 receptor, which happens to be coupled with GI, I do expect an inhibitory response. And inhibiting SA and AV node means decreasing the heart rate, or in physiology, a negative chronotropy effect. Of course, decreasing the heart rate, if I had to worry about what this could do with muscarinic agonist, clearly it could cause a potential for AV block. And with AV block, if atria don't communicate well with ventricles through the AV node, then there could be a lack of correlation between atrial filling and emptying and ventricular emptying and filling. So that there could be a compromise cardiac output. That's always the pitfall with muscarinic drugs. They can very much affect the heart rate. An agonist will potentially result in an AV block. If I was to ask you, what would that do to an EKG tracing? How do I measure AV conduction on an EKG? Do you remember the interval? I know you remember the interval. You're yelling at me, it's just I can't hear you, but I know you're telling me an increased PR interval. An increased PR interval would classically be associated in ANS pharmacology with muscarinic agonist and the time between atrial depolarization and ventricular depolarization. There is also not only decreased firing rate, negative chronotropy, but decreasing conduction velocity, therefore what we call negative chronotropy. So all this adds up to slowing down the heart. What is important is to then note for a good question that dissects the effect on the heart, that there is no effects on ventricles, Perkin system, particularly there is no negative inotropic effect, and we don't innovate the muscle with parasympathetic. Well, we'll leave that heart tissue where it sits right now, and I expect muscarinic agonist to cause bradycardia. In turn, it means a muscarinic antagonist would prevent the bradycardia effect of astiocholine, leaving sympathetic predominant and resulting in, importantly, tachycardia, speeding up conduction and causing potentially ventricles to build too fast, which could also be life threatening. Let's look a little bit now at smooth muscle. In smooth muscle, we find ultimately M3 receptors which are GQ coupled. And now remember that these M3 receptors being GQ coupled increase calcium in a smooth muscle. So, of course, I want contraction of that smooth muscle. Now, the first place we studied that contraction was in the eye. So, of course, let's look at the eye again. And there were muscarinic M3 receptors in the sphincter muscle of the iris. Their contraction resulted in meiosis, but also in the ciliary muscles of the eye and ciliary muscle, the contraction allowed the lens to become more spherical, allowing accommodation for neovision. So focusing was associated with that muscarinic response. You realize well that then if you were under the influence of a muscarinic agonist, you would see meiosis, but you would also have a patient who complains of blurred vision. Blurred vision from the standpoint that they see clear what's close to their nose tip, but everything in the distance will become blurry. Conversely, let's not forget the muscarinic antagonist will prevent the meiosis, so we'll see dilated pupil, and prevent accommodation, which will still cause blurred vision. But this time the blurry vision will be for near vision. You won't be able to focus on something that's close by. So never forget blurred vision is a hallmark feature of a muscarinic drug. And adding the information about the pupil size will tell you whether you're an agonist or Blocker. Anyone remember what we called muscarinic antagonism's effect on accommodation? Are you saying cycloplegia? Remember, that's the word we use for paralysis of accommodation. Other smooth muscle that are territories for parasympathetic to cause contraction. The lungs with their bronchioles, where bronchospasm is expected. Of course, I will always worry about an asthma or chronic, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient. Clearly, promoting bronchospasm will worsen the asthma or COPD. Conversely, if I use a muscarinic antagonist, I might find a little niche in asthmatics or COPD patient. As far as major territories that are made of smooth muscle and have high parasympathetic innovation, who wouldn't think of GI tract and urinary tract, such as the bladder? No doubt they are parasympathetic, chiefly stimulate motility of these muscles to increase peristalsis. In the gut, increased motility could result in cramp, could result in too much motility and diarrhea. In the GU tract, contraction of the bladder, of the detrusor muscle, is going to be associated with a potential for voiding so that urinary incontinence could become an issue. Now, of course, the opposite is true of a muscarinic antagonist, which will slow down that motility, prevent the cramping, prevent the voiding, and cause retention. Let's look at the glands now. The gland is the third aspect of muscarinic receptor, and it's the easiest one. If the smooth muscle are all in constriction, the heart is slowed down, all secretions are always increased. And wherever the glands are, whether they're in the mouth with salvation, in the eye with lacrimation, in the lungs with bronchial secretion, in the gut with mucus or enzyme secretion, wherever these glands are, I see increased secretion. So where could I play a little bit with these glands and their secretion medically? Well, let's revisit asthma and COPD, because now I'm saying in the lungs, not only I have bronchospasm to minimize the outflow of air causing COPD, I'm also increasing gland secretion, not in the bronchioles, there's no glands there, but in the major bronchi, that worsens the obstruction. So now I have two reasons to avoid muscarinic agonists in COPDs or asthma. Of course, conversely, a muscarinic antagonist will dry out these secretions. Less secretion, less obstruction. Let's, revisiting, let's revisit the role of these glands in the GI tract. In the GI tract, the increased gland secretion means potential greater acid secretion. It is, to my knowledge, for USMLE Step 1, the only place where we'll play with the fact that an M1 receptor is responsible for increased secretion of glands in the gut. Anywhere else, you're always, say, uh, you're always safe saying M3, except there. But let's think of too much secretion of acid. You know that patients with peptic ulcer disease are not going to be happy with a muscarinic agonist. Of course, conversely, the muscarinic antagonist drying the secretion would help in peptic ulcer disease patients. Overall, we see a logical pharmacology, whereby where parasympathetic innovate, there is three main responses, decreasing cardiac function, increasing the tone of smooth muscle, increasing secretions. Now, as two special places there. When we look at the sphincters of GIG tract, just put it in perspective with the role of acetylcholine and parasympathetic to promote voiding. Obviously, if you want to void, you need to relax the sphincters. So how can a receptor that is GQ coupled cause relaxation of sphincters? Well, in places where it relaxes sphincters, it's simply because the GQ coupling can activate which enzyme that results in production of a gas, which in turn can relax smooth muscle. You remember that? 
GQ coupled receptors in their appropriate location can activate nitric oxide synthase. So the relaxation of sphincters in the GIGU tract to promote voiding is going to very much be associated indirectly to NO. Now, we could talk about this here on the exam, but I'll tell you why I like it the best for the exam for the role of NO. It's in the blood vessels. Now there, highlight it a different color for yourself. When you look at the blood vessels, they have muscarinic receptors, but these receptors are not on the smooth muscle. They're on the endothelium of the vessel, meaning the GQ coupling is absolutely not associated with contraction of that blood vessel. It's actually associated with relaxation, being that the endothelium will make that nitric oxide. Well, an important aspect of these blood vessels, muscarinic receptors, they are not innovative. There's simply no parasympathetic nerve that is reaching the endothelium of my vessel, causing the dilation. So we're not too sure, pretty much at the physiological level, who does the job. But if the receptor is there, a drug that binds to this receptor can, if it stimulates it, cause vasodilation, lowering of blood pressure, and a potential bowel receptor reflex. I do want to know this, if anything, because of the problems with the tracings that were reviewed together at a later time when we see the entire ANS. There's another aspect to the fact that there's no innovation. If there's no nerve terminal to release acetylcholine to bind to a muscarinic receptor of the endothelium, if there's no nerve terminal, this doesn't exist. Well, how would an indirect acting drug ever cause that dilation? It can't. There is no acetylcholine to be maintained in that synapse. So there's no effect of acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. There is no effect of indirect agonist drugs when there is no innovation. Can you remind me from the previous chapter what was a receptor to epinephrine that had no innovation? I'm hoping you're saying the beta-2 receptor. So this statement also holds for beta-2 receptors. It holds for any receptor that has no innovation. When there's no innovation, there is no effect of indirect acting drug. So here it's quite relevant because an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor should have all the effect of a muscarinic agonist except at one place, except at the blood vessel level. An indirect agonist cannot vasodilate. I would like you to go over that table as many times as you need. Once you're comfortable with it, once you really totally an understanding of what you expect from those parasympathetic responses that involve muscarinic receptors, then the pharmacology is going to be a breeze. Look, all I need now is to say, Drug X is a muscarinic agonist. And then I know everything in that table is a story for that drug X to be both tested on. So all I need now is the vocabulary of a few muscarinic agonists. Now, direct acting agonists will bind directly to the receptors, and direct acting agonists will change the levels of acetylcholine in the synapse that depend on intact innovation. And in all situations, when I use muscarinic agonists, I will always expect to see excessive secretion with tremendous sweating, tremendous lacrimation, salivation, whatever you want. All secretions are increased. And obviously, one big complaint will be GI distress. Those muscarinic agonists effect invariably will be associated with cramping and potential diarrhea. So prepare some extra change of underwear just in case. Now, beyond this, could you remind me of potentially life threatening effect? Sweating would be hardly one. Diarrhea, unless you slip in it and break your neck, would unlikely be one too. But what happens to the heart with muscarinic agonists? You remember the bradycardia and the potential AV block? Don't forget, any muscarinic agonist could cause this. So let's put a few examples of muscarinic agonists, and for this, let's turn the page. In this table, you're seeing direct acting cholinomimetics. Of course, acetylcholine could be possibly a drug. Now, it's not really used clinically except in cataract surgery, but on a board step one question, let's not forget it is the endogenous agonist of both muscarinic and nicotinic receptor, and it is metabolized by acetylcholine esterase. Why is it that acetylcholine not used really clinically? Not so much because it's endogenous, but because of its kinetic. You know, neurotransmitters tend to have a very short half-life, so it would not be practical to treat someone with acetylcholine as a myotic agent in cataract surgery just to give an indication. No, rather than acetylcholine, notice that there are three drugs that follow in this table where if you're smart, it sounds like acetylcholine. You have methacholine, so there's choline, you have bethanicol, and you have carbacol. Now, they're slightly different in their activity. Methacholine is primarily muscarinic, much more than nicotinic. Bethanicol is purely muscarinic. And carbacol is equally muscarinic and nicotinic, just like acetylcholine. But what is common to all three, they certainly all have the muscarinic agonist activity of the table. Methacholine is sufficiently similar to acetylcholine to be partly metabolized by acetylcholine esterase. And it's not used as a drug for treatment. It's used for diagnosis, DX for diagnosis. And it's used to diagnose bronchial hyperreactivity. Imagine this. You give a small dose of methacholine, a dose that is so small that if you don't have any issues with asthma or COPD, you are simply not going to respond to such a small amount of muscarinic agonist. On the other hand, you're someone who has hyperreactive bronchi then that small dose of methacholine will be sufficient to trigger bronchospasm and show as wheezing, of course as a sign, but also possibly on spirometry. So methacholine is used as a test to help diagnose bronchial hyperreactivity. This said, all muscarinic agonists can cause bronchospasm and aggravate COPD and asthma. That's true of the drug bethanicol, and although bethanicol is used to treat paralytic ileus, so for lazy gut, you know, a paralytic ileus can occur simply because you had general anesthesia and the anesthetic just paralyzed your gut. It could happen because of lack of innovation of the gut, maybe in Hirschsprung disease, in an aganglionic portion of the colon. Well, in all these situations, giving a direct acting agonist will stimulate peristalsis. Do understand that you would not want to give a muscarinic agonist to some Someone who had an obstructive ileus. Hey, if you have a mechanical obstruction like a gallstone ileus, a fecaloma, an intussusception, I don't know, a volvulus, what would happen if you were increasing peristalsis and pressure upstream from a mechanical obstruction? I think you realize that eh, we're talking paralytic and not obstructive because they're the muscarinic agonist by increasing intraluminal pressure could result in worsening of the outcome of ileus, which is rupture, and rupture would come with peritonitis and potential septicemia. Muscarinic agonists like bethanicol can also be used to stimulate the bladder that's not responding well, such as a neurogenic bladder of a diabetic of someone who has denervation and so forth. So also used for urinary retention. If you wanted a side effect, you know directly from stimulation of the gut or the GU tract, there could be some issues of diarrhea and incontinence. But the real side effects are those you weren't banking on. If you wanted to treat the gut or the GU tract, you can't prevent bethanicol from doing what to your pupils? Medrisis or meiosis? Hopefully you're saying meiosis, sphincter muscle contraction of the iris. Would there be an effect on accommodation on a board question? Absolutely. Muscarinic agonists would cause a spasm for accommodation. What would happen to all secretions? Are they decreased? 
not at all. There's increased secretion with salvation, with, of course, tearing, with increased GI secretion, and peptic ulcer disease. I'm telling you, everything from that table becomes a point on the boards. Bethanicol will slow your heart rate, increase the PR interval. Bethanicol, importantly, would do what to your blood vessels? It may not be innovated, but the receptors are there. And the production of NO by the endothelium would then cause massive dilation and dropping blood pressure, maybe even causing a reflex tachycardia on your book question. So I like Bethanicol. Bethanicol is really a beautiful muscular agonist to be tested on. Carbocol is just there for memory. It's used primarily as a meiotic agent because it's meiosis, so it's using glaucoma. We'll talk more about glaucoma towards the end of the argument. Pilocarpine is the other big drug with Bethanicol I would know as a classic muscular agonist. Although it's primarily used topically in glaucoma, it's also very much in use for dry mouth, for xerostomia. And you know dry mouth can occur in Sjogren's syndrome, an autoimmune disease where immune complexes cause inflammatory damage and fibrosis of exocrine glands, particularly lacrimal and salivary glands. So it helps promote some of the secretion in this malocarpine. For this intent, I've added the drug Sevimelin. Sevimelin is actually a muscarinic M3 agonist. And you know what the relevance could be on a board question with a drug like Sevimelin. If it's M3 agonist, it's perfect to raise secretion. But what is it that it will not have that polycarpine would have? Well, first thing that would come to my mind is I don't expect Sevimelin to slow the heart because that was mediated by which receptor the bradycardia? Absolutely. It was due to an M2 receptor. Hey, no bradycardia? I like that. No AV block. Let's try another one. What are you going to tell me if I'm a patient with peptic ulcer disease and I wanted to treat the dry mouth? I have to take it by mouth, right? If I have peptic ulcer disease, a muscular agonist like polycarpine will raise acid secretion and cause worsening of my peptic ulcer, maybe perforation. If I'm an M3 selective, I suddenly remember, that's right, GI secretions, it was M1. M3 stimulation is going to be devoid of exacerbation of peptic ulcer disease. It's those refined points that make the choice of a drug the day of your exam and in the future in your practice a better tailored choice for your patient. So no sevimidine as a selective M3 agonist, whereas the others were not selective. In the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor section, we are now investigating the indirect acting effect of drugs that block the degradation of acetylcholine. If you block acetylcholinesterase, as stated, you increase the duration of action of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So you now overstimulate both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Classically, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are divided in two groups. The one that I use for CNS acetylcholinesterase inhibition and the ones more appropriate for INS section that are called peripheral acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Let's get rid of the centrally acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. There are two big drugs to commit to memory that are centrally acting, so not for ANS. These are rivastigmine and donepazil. I know some of us still remember Tatrin, which was a prototype, but Tatrin has not been available in the US for years. That's why it's not in your syllabus. Rivastigmine is newer than Donepazil. Both are used in Alzheimer's disease. If you recall in pathology, Alzheimer's disease has one chemical correlation. There is a decreased acetylcholine in the CNS. Acetylcholine is indeed critical in the dentate gyrus of your hippocampus to mediate recent memory event, declarative memory event, and is also critically a stimulatory neurotransmitter in frontal cortex, so for your behavior, for your regular psychological and cognitive type of function. If there's a destruction of acetylcholine nerve terminals simply coming from degeneration of the cell bodies and what we call Maynard's nucleus, or nucleus basalis of Maynard, then maybe trying to raise levels of acetylcholine will symptomatically at least help in the dementia of that patient. If it's true for Alzheimer's disease dementia, it might help also in dementia of other causes, such as Parkinson's dementia, for which rivastigmine has also been FDA approved. Not the nepazil. The nepazil is only for Alzheimer's disease. Here's my biggest issue. Beautiful. I know raising acetylcholine in the patient's brain is going to help for dementia. But how do I take these drugs? With a needle directly in the brain? I always say you can't do that. You're going to bend the needle. So you have to take it and swallow it. If you swallow it, the very first place these drugs will raise acetylcholine is not in your brain. It's in your body. And the excess acetylcholine in the rest of the body will give you the classic extension of muscarinic pharmacology, identical to that of bethanicol, pilocarpine, sevimelin, and so forth, including the rare AV block. Rare doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Hopefully you won't see it in your practice, because if you do, then we end up with a forensic case, and that you don't like. But it's a possibility to be aware of. Well, we'll leave those centrally acting drugs more for the CNS section. Let's stay with the periphery. And in the peripheral acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, you do have three major drugs to have in mind. Edrophonium, neostigmine and its family, so you see pyridostigmine, physostigmine, and then the group of irreversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that are called organophosphates. Now, we need to play with those to be nice and ready for our board questions. If I look at edrophonium, edrophonium has one point. It is very short-acting. So if it is short-acting, I can't imagine treating anyone with edrophonium on a chronic basis. So it's purely used as a diagnostic tool. And the classic issue of edrophonium is primarily, first and foremost, the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Now, look, if I made a little diagram on the side. Here's a nerve terminal releasing acetylcholine. This acetylcholine is about to stimulate a nicotinic M type of receptor of a skeletal muscle. So SK for skeletal. And as I'm looking at this acetylcholine stimulating the nicotinic receptors, I'm then hoping that by stimulating this receptor, there would be skeletal muscle activity. There would be contraction. What's happening in myasthenia? I'm sure you remember, we have a fabulous type 2 hypersensitivity, fabulous only for the description, obviously, whereby autoantibodies, I'm going to call them ADS for antibodies and not for antilog breaks, that's on your Toyota. So these autoantibodies are actually blocking these nicotinic muscle type of receptors. These antibodies, they don't cause damage to the muscle. What they do is literally, just like in Graves' disease, there is stimulation of TSH receptors by the autoantibodies. Here in my senior gravis, these autoantibodies antagonize the receptors. If you don't have the receptors functional, you get flaccid paralysis. And that flaccid paralysis is bad enough when you have droopy eyelids and a slack jaw. It gets pretty catastrophic when your legs give way and you fall, or worse, when eventually your diaphragm fails to function and you can't breathe. So what could I do? If I know that these antibodies are competitive inhibitors, 
then very smartly, I know that if I increase acetylcholine and that patient's nicotinic synapses, the increased acetylcholine will kick the antibody off the synapse. And as it kicks the antibody off the synapse, then I restore, I reinstate skeletal muscle contraction. To raise acetylcholine in the synapse, let's block acetylcholine as the raise. So picture this, a patient comes in with flaccid paralysis, maybe with ptosis, and a complaint of weakness of the muscle. That weakness is in a young female patient and worsens with exercise. So you give a little test dose of edrophonium intramuscular and you measure muscle tone. If muscle tone improves dramatically, you have diagnosed my senior gravis. Well, now you've diagnosed it, what are you going to use for treatment? Of course, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor that has a longer duration of action. And the prototype being neostigmine, that's the classic drug that would be used to treat Rx for treatment of my senior gravis. Now your patient happily goes home, she takes the neostigmine. And what happens a few days later, by the time you reach steady state of the drug, there's much higher levels than they were initially. And unfortunately, overstimulation of the nicotinic receptors caused them to desensitize. As they desensitize, they don't work. Here comes flaccid paralysis again. But this time, that, plas that flaccid paralysis is not due to my senior. It is due to excessive neostigmine causing stimulation of the nicotinic receptor. It's what we call then a cholinergic crisis. Well, how are you going to know as a practitioner whether the flaccid paralysis is due to the disease, then you need more drug, or due to the cholinergic crisis? You're going to go back to the hydrophonium. And this time, you're going to use hydrophonium for differential diagnosis, DDX in medicine, differential diagnosis with cholinergic crisis. If hydrophonium fails to increase contraction, it's because your patient had too much neostigmine and is undergoing the desensitization process we call a cholinergic crisis. Then stop the neostigmine or decrease its dose. Conversely, if the hydrophonium still manages to increase contractility, it must be because there wasn't enough neostigmine or the patient didn't take their drug as they were supposed to. Fine, how about side effects of all this? When you give hydrophonium short acting, we don't care about the side effects. When you give neostigmine to take home, well, then of course we'll worry about side effects. The excess acetylcholine is also going to overstimulate muscarinic receptors, which are unaffected in mycenia gravis. So look in your third column to decrease the excessive muscarinic side effects while diagnosing or treating the actual mycenia. Then, of course, a muscarinic antagonist is always co administered, particularly an atropine like drug. Once you know that first point, the story of hydrophonium and neostigmine with myasthenia, I want you to know two other points for peripheral acetylcholinesterase inhibitors in medicine. You know, very similar to the story of myasthenia is the idea of competitive neuromuscular blocking drugs. See the diagram I built with myasthenia in your margin? Well, that pink cross doesn't have to be antibodies. It could be curare-like drugs. Curare-like drugs are also competitive inhibitors of nicotinic receptors. That neuromuscular blockade they cause is very effective to cause flaccid paralysis in specific settings, namely an emergency room and operating room, particularly with flaccid muscle. It's easier to do surgery. It's also what is a prerequisite to intubate the patient. Otherwise, there would be laryngospasm and potential injury and so forth. But once you're done with the curare-like drug, well, how do you reverse the competitive neuromuscular blocker? Exactly like you reversed the autoantibodies that were responsible for myasthenia with a neostigmine-like drug. Pyridostigmine would work just as well. So that would be my number two story. If you want to use neostigmine-like drugs for post-operative GI or GU retention, you remember the paralytic ileus, the neurogenic bladder, you're welcome to do so. Although you have the nicotinic pharmacology and a muscarinic agonist like bacanicol could have been more relevant. Now, the third aspect I want you to have is the story with physostigmine. Now, physostigmine sounds awfully like neo and doesn't it? Except for one key thing you would not invent. Physostigmine is anionized and can cross the blood-brain barrier. And if it can cross the blood-brain barrier, it is fair to say physostigmine, just like the drugs for Alzheimer's disease, is going to have both peripheral and central effect. When do I use physostigmine? Exclusively to treat anticholinergic toxicity. And life-threatening anticholinergic toxicity, a classic example is atropine overdose. Atropine is a prototypical muscarinic antagonist. It blocks muscarinic receptors in the periphery. Raising acetylcholine with physostigmine will remove the blocker. It's again a competitive block by atropine. But atropine also blocks muscarinic receptors in our brain. Atropine crosses the blood-brain barrier. So you cannot choose neostigmine or pyridostigmine to treat an anticholinergic overdose. You must choose an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor that crosses the blood-brain barrier. That's where physostigmine comes in handy for a good question. Now you have all the clinically used acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Overall, what's left is the poisons that are organophosphates. Organophosphate, you might recognize in the name phosphate. And echothiophate that you see at the bottom of the table is an organophosphate that has clinical use. It's used topically in glaucoma. I really don't care too much about this. What I care about is the organophosphate as they're used for insecticide purposes. Classic example of this would be drugs like malathion, parathion, but also diazinon, propyrifos. All these organophosphates that are used as insecticide. Even if you bug someone, you shouldn't be sprayed with insecticides. So what can happen that a human would have insecticides in their system? That's pretty easy. It could be an accident, but it's more likely an intentional overdose in order to try and commit suicide. To have access to the insecticides requires specific professions where you would have access to those drugs and chemicals. And most classically on your exam, it'll be a farmer. Of course, if it's not a farmer, it could be someone working for pest control, for instance. Now, there are organophosphates that are specifically used to kill humans. I'm safe, I'm French, I'm not human. But for you guys, it means nerve gases. And nerve gases by far, like Taven, Seren, Soman, nerve gases, Agent VX, if you want. All these nerve gases have in common that they are irreversibly blocking acetylcholinesterase. So as I'm looking at these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that are irreversible, this time, we're not talking a little bit of acetylcholine in the synapse. We're talking a huge amount and for a huge amount of time. So we need to describe this toxicity. Now, as a note in this table, malathion and parathion primarily kill insects rather than the farmer because they're pro-drugs. And as pro-drugs, the enzymes which happen to be cytochrome P450s are very much prevalent in the insect rather than the human. So malathion and parathion are more directed towards killing the insect than the human. But they said an overdose would definitely do its job. Let's check out the toxicity of these irreversibly acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitors a little bit more in detail. It's easy for the acute toxicity. Frankly, I'm just giving you here a review of what we've seen. The acute toxicity clearly is due to the excessive muscarinic and nicotinic receptor stimulation. So what are the muscarinic effects about? You remember that big table? They consist of diarrhea, urination, so you look a little messy. Of course, pinpoint pupil. 
a very slow heart, now that's bad because you could have AV block, and big problems with breathing because of bronchospasm. Of course, other muscarinic effects were involved, increase whole secretions. That means this patient with diarrhea, with diarrhea, urination, meiosis, slow heart rate, and bronchospasm also lacrimates, salivates, and sweats profusely. Now, these organophosphate cross the blood-brain barrier, so there's also a great deal of CNS stimulation, potentially all the points to seizures with too much stimulation. So really, the muscarinic effects themselves are pretty nasty. Now you add on the nicotinic pharmacology. Nicotinic pharmacology-wise, you very much expect skeletal muscle excitation with twitching, potential fasciculation, but quickly because of desensitization, paralysis, and that paralysis means you won't be able to breathe. So now your heart is stopping, you have severe bronchospasm, and you have diaphragm paralysis. It's not complicated, you're dying unless we manage you pretty quickly. In the margin, the classic memory aid in US med schools is dumbbells. And dumbbells, you think the first letters for all the muscarinic effects. So you remember muscarinic, like diarrhea, urination, myosis, bradycardia, bronchospasm, lacrimation, salivation, and sweating. The only part that is truly nicotinic is the excitation followed by paralysis of the muscle. The CNS excitation is both nicotinic and muscarinic. So what do you think we're going to do to the excessive muscarinic effect? No doubt, to treat the excess muscarinic effect, I'm going to give that patient atropine. And atropine, the muscarinic antagonist which crosses the blood-brain barrier, should take care of all the muscarinic stimulation. I'm still left with the issue of the nicotinic receptors. And for nicotinic receptors, I have really a big problem, which is if the receptor has been overstimulated and desensitized, giving a blocker is not going to help because a blocker has no effect. And giving an agonist will worsen everything because the agonist will further stimulate and desensitize the receptor. So there's no two ways. If I want to reinstate muscle control so that the patient can breathe on their own and avoid ventilation and intubation, I must regenerate the acetylcholinesterase at the neuromuscular junction. There is one drug or one group of drugs that can be used for that. They're called oxines. The classic example is the drug pralidoxin, often referred to as 2PAM. Now, for your exam with organophosphate, don't underestimate also questions about chronic exposure to these same organophosphates. Chronic exposure means you're not acutely exposed to high amount. You are just chronically exposed through your environment to small, minute amount of organophosphates. You're a farmer, you use it to spray your groves, your crops. You're a pest control individual, you spray it also on plants, hopefully not inside houses. Although they said, you know, organophosphate at low levels are often used when we spray against mosquitoes in our country. So we're all exposed in our environment to small amounts of organophosphate. Organophosphate are extremely reactive. And as they're extremely reactive and lipid soluble, they love very much to bind to myelin, which is a complex lipid of nerves. This results in some way into causing immune responses against the myelin. It's as if the organophosphate, by attaching to myelin, behaves as a haptone and now is big enough to trigger immune responses. That demyelination that ensues will be exhibiting muscle weakness, sensory losses, very much like multiple sclerosis or Guillain-Barré syndrome. Except demyelination has nothing to do with acetylcholinesterase inhibition. So on your exam, forget about giving 2-PAM and atropine. That would be absolutely useless. And demyelination, we don't know how to treat it. If we knew, we'd be treating multiple sclerosis effectively today. So chronic exposure has no treatment and is associated with demyelination. If agonists are easily reviewed by working with this table, you know that antagonists will block the effect of muscarinic receptors. The classic antagonist as a prototype for the class of muscarinic receptor antagonist is the drug atropine. The fun thing for us in medicine is that other anti-muscarinic drugs are primarily different because of their pharmacokinetic properties, which is unlikely a board point, whether step one or step two. Maybe a relevance would be to know if you are more selective from one receptor or the other, but remember, except for our 7 million drug, we really had primarily no selectivity of muscarinic drugs in general. So maybe do you cross the blood-brain barrier or not? Most anti-muscarinic drugs will. Certainly atropine does. As a tertiary amine, it does enter the CNS. So if you describe atropine's pharmacology, understand that you've described anti-muscarinic pharmacology as a group. One interesting aspect of knowing atropine pharmacology is you are hitting enough birds to have no flocks of birds for a lifetime there with one single stone. I'm not kidding you. It seems to me like muscarinic receptors are some of the most promiscuous receptors in pharmacology. Pretty much most classes of drug out there tend to have some muscarinic blockade, which will then be a cause for side effects. Look at the short list, which is not final, but which represents the major group of drugs which have atropine-like side effects. The vast majority of antihistamines, and most of them are over-the-counter, are pretty strong antimuscarinic. Often, we'll learn that they even used as antimuscarinic. Every single tricyclic antidepressant. All antipsychotics, whether typical or atypical, have some muscarinic pharmacology, some stronger than others. Now, amazingly, antiarrhythmics such as quinidine, such as procainamide, nisopyramide, we'll see, will be classically antimuscarinic. Antiviral drugs like amantadine are so strongly antimuscarinic, we'll use it as such in Parkinson's disease. Even some opiates like meperidine are antimuscarinic and have significant atropine like side effects. So, what you're reviewing right there is something that could be both tested under many different clinical vignettes. So, be strongly aware of this before you get too far. All antimuscarinics, no matter what they're called, will always be contraindicated or used with extreme caution, at the very least, in people with BPH. Why? In BPH, what's the pathology? You have a big prostate. So you're happy. You'd love to show your prostate to everyone. It's not a good idea. But if you have a big prostate, unfortunately, compressing the urethra like a slit opening, it causes urinary retention. And it's that urinary retention that then increases the risk of urinary tract infection, which can ascend to the kidney called spinonephritis, what if you were diabetic, and so forth. So BPH, a significantly common but tremendous pathology of older males. All antimuscarinic will decrease voiding. And as they decrease voiding, they worsen the symptoms and the potential dangers associated with BPH. Do notice that then over-the-counter medications such as antihistamines, which are prevalent in cold and allergy preparations, would not be good for someone with BPH, which is virtually two-thirds of males over 60 years of age. How about glaucoma? We remember antimuscarinic will actually cause medriasis, and medriasis is going to interfere with aqueous humor outflow. So particularly if your patient had a narrow-angle glaucoma, then there could be an acute exacerbation of this glaucoma so that the patient would be more likely, in some cases within hours, to develop irreversible retinal damage and blindness. Two big contraindications to antimuscarinics, BPH and narrow-angle glaucoma. Here you have a 39-year-old farmer brought to the emergency room in distress. You measure the pulse as 45 beats per minute, a blood pressure of 80 over 50. 
The farmer's pupils are constricted. The skin is cool, wet, and clammy. Very characteristic, isn't it? I would like the mode of action of the likely offending agent, and your choice is a blockade of postsynaptic, presynaptic receptors, or reuptake, catabolism, or release of neurotransmitters. In this toxicology appendix, I'm sure you are recognizing with a key presentation of dumbbells, as we know well in the history of a pharma, probably an intoxication with the organophosphate insecticides. Organophosphate insecticides, if you recall, are irreversible inhibitors of the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase is the enzyme responsible for taking acetylcholine and breaking it down to choline plus acetate. By inhibiting this enzyme, you would raise levels of acetylcholine with the organophosphate. Increased acetylcholine will now cause, in turn, excess muscarinic and excess nicotinic stimulations. Don't forget the use of atropine to block the excess muscarinic stimulation and the potential for drugs like pralidoxin or 2PAM to reverse the neuromuscular effects or regenerate the acetylcholine esterase at the neuromuscular junction. However, we know then that it is, in our question, by decreasing the catabolism of neurotransmitter that organophosphates are going to be working. Answer D is the correct answer. Now, with these logical points, let's explore the pharmacological effects of atropine, which here are shown to you with increasing dosage of atropine. The very first thing to go off with atropine are oil secretions. All these secretions will be decreased. So it means classically a dry mouth. Dry mouth becomes one of the cardinal signs associated with antimuscarinic presence. Now, can I use decreased secretion? You bet I can. What if I'm about to intubate someone? I know that then aspiration injury can become an issue. I know that in someone where I intend on doing maybe a significant CNS depression for surgery, there could be an aspiration injury that would then cause possible damage to the lung tissue. So decreasing secretion is classically done prior to intubation. It could be also people who have hyperhidrosis type of states. So as you increase further the dose, here comes the eye. And the eye, not only I see medriasis, but remember, you also see cyclopedia. Now, cyclopedia is seldom useful to have blurry vision, although... Sometimes it's used for children who may have too much tone to their ciliary muscle and have a problem with stopping accommodation so they see blur in the distance. Rather, medriasis is a big clinical use of antimuscarinic. When do you want to dilate the patient's pupil? You want to dilate their pupil to do an eye exam. So anything with ophthalmology where you want to see, are there any uh, cotton wool exudate, uh, maybe damage from uh, malignant hypertension, from diabetes? Is there a cherry red spot in single lipidosis? When all these situations, dilating the, the pupil is a prerequisite to the examination. Antimuscarinic drugs commonly used for that. Do understand that then the patient will have blurred vision. And by the time I put together dry mouth and blurred vision, I guarantee you the drug is a muscarinic antagonist. So know these as cardinal signs of exposure to a muscarinic antagonist. Now, if I can't sweat, I can't cool off. And if I can't cool off, I'm going to have neurogenic vasodilation to try and exchange heat with the environment. It does mean that I have a significant risk of hyperthermia, and clearly I have very hot, red, dry skin. And that hot, red, dry skin is also going to classically accompany people who are exposed to anti-muscarinics. What will really potentially tip the balance in favor of a severe side effect is that higher doses, antimuscarinics are classically cardiotoxic. That cardiotoxicity will be shown as a significant tachycardia, primarily due to the unopposed sympathetic effect, which is constantly stimulating the patient's heart. That tachycardia could be a ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia can precede ventricular fibrillation and death. Another possibility with antimuscarinic and too much sympathetic is to see torsad rhythm. And torsad rhythm, as I always say, torsades de pointes, which <laughs> obviously always makes me laugh, being the French, torsade de pointe, as they call. Well, these are life-threatening conditions, so I do want you to know that all antimuscarinic have at least one C for cardiotoxicity. If these drugs stay in the periphery, then at the highest dosage of antimuscarinic, you'll start blocking GI and GU contraction so that urinary retention and constipation will complete the picture peripherally of antimuscarinic. But what if you cross the blood-brain barrier? You remember how acetylcholine is importantly stimulatory? At the least, you should see CNS depression. And CNS depression should be represented by sedation, drowsiness, which is very common of antimuscarinic medication. How far can that CNS depression go? Let's put another C in our toxicity, and that positive C would be coma. So cardiotoxicity, coma, two of the key Cs of atropine-like drugs and their intoxication. Now, when you depress the CNS, Imagine that what you're depressing was a GABA neuron that used to be stimulated by acetylcholine. CNS depression also means excitation. If you shut down the inhibitory effect of GABA, you are now with excitatory effect in your CNS to the point of developing seizures, of having behavioral excitation, becoming incoherent, becoming intoxicated, maybe having hallucinations. That is a basis for abusing antimuscarinic as drugs, but that's also a basis for the third seat of antimuscarinic toxicity, which is to have convulsions. It means, in my clinical mind, toxicology of antimuscarinics, three Cs. Cardiotoxicity, at the very least, from the peripheral effect, with ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, toxide being commonly seen, required emergent management. And if they cross the blood-brain barrier, two CNS toxicity of significance, coma and convulsions. Now, in that treatment of the acute intoxication, by far, it will be symptomatic, trying to get rid of the drug. But if you wanted, quote-unquote, for your exam an antidote, don't forget physostigmine. Physostigmine, the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor that crossed the blood-brain barrier, was capable, of course, of raising acetylcholine and kicking the blocker off the receptor. Now, we went slowly through that atropine pharmacology because of its weight, because of its prevalence with many drugs. In this chapter, we're only going to focus on anti-muscarinic drugs that are used as such. So we're not going to look at TCAs, antipsychotics, amantadine, and so forth, antihistamines, just drugs that are used like atropine words. And if atropine is a prototype in your table, it is used as an antispasmodic. It is used to dry out secretion. Obviously, we just saw it used in the management of acetylcholine esterase inhibitor overdose, make it an organophosphate overdose. It can be used to promote constipation in people with diarrhea. It is very much used in ophthalmology for dilated pupils and eye exam. It can be used emergently to reverse AV block, but it's very long-acting. Long-acting, I mean, I'm talking a half-life for atropine that is 24 to 48 hours 
So you stop taking atropine, two days later you still have dilated pupil and you can't poop. Uh, that's not too good. So do we have better pharmacokinetics? You bet. Particularly in the context of ophthalmology. When you do an eye exam, you don't need your patient to have dilated pupil for three weeks. Three hours would be better. And drugs that sound like atropine, such as tropicamide, homatropine, but also an annoying drug like cyclopentolate. These are topicals that are used to dilate pupil in ophthalmology. If I'm lucky, I'm hoping for a drug like tropicamide on the exam. How about for people with asthma or COPD. Not only you dry out the secretion, you prevent the bronchoconstrictive action of muscarinic stimulation in the bronchioles. So muscarinic antagonists that are used for this, not atropine nowadays, but they sound like atropine. Notice drugs like ipratropium, you see atropine right there, teotropium. They sound enough like atropine that I should have no problem associating them with anti-muscarinic pharmacology. They're used primarily as inhalation. So inhalation means you should have primarily an effect locally in the lungs, although there's great absorption, as you know, great perfusion of these lungs. If they get in systemically, there's no worry for CNS effect because these are ionized drugs. And we call from our general principles as ionized drugs, so they're more water soluble, so they will not cross the blood-brain barrier. So if I was to overdose, I drop two of the C's of my overdose. No coma, no convulsions. And an advantage of these drugs when it comes to asthma and COPD, when we say an anti-muscarinic drug decreases secretion, we mean it decreases the volume of that secretion. There's less secretion made. We're not saying it's drying out the mucus. That's very important because if you were drying out mucus, you would form mucus pellets that are very viscous and that would worsen COPD. So no, these drugs, they decrease total volume of secretion that do not change mucus viscosity. Now, other atropine-like drugs may have fancier uses than those very classic peripheral effect of anti-muscarinic. For example, a drug like scopolamine, which really doesn't sound like atropine, does it? A drug like scopolamine is a classic anti-muscarinic that is used for central effect of astiocholine. You see, astiocholine is also important out of nerve 8, the auditory nerve, particularly at the level of the vestibulum. And it's acetylcholine that promotes the information of motion, particularly circular motion, to my brain, particularly cerebellum, ocular pathways, in order to have a feeling of motion and potentially adjust my body posture, my eye, my face with that motion. Unfortunately, it also directly feeds into vomiting centers so that some of us are very sensitive to motion and get motion sickness. If it's primarily mediated by astiocholine and muscarinic receptors, any anti-muscarinic that crosses the blood-brain barrier will treat motion sickness. Scopolamine is only used for that. But if I show you back the top of this page, what is a group of drugs that is over-the-counter that is very classically used for motion sickness? Are you thinking like me antihistamines? Obviously, I don't take an antihistamine because I have an allergy to travel. It just reminds you a key point about antihistamines. They are strong anti-muscarinic drugs. So scopolamine, antihistamines often use for motion sickness. If you cross the blood-brain barrier, there is no doubt you can cause sedation. If you interfere with the effect of acetylcholine in your CNS, we saw how lack of acetylcholine was associated with Alzheimer. Alzheimer has a problem with short-term memory. You take a scopolamine-like drug or an anti-muscarinic drug, you have short-term memory blockade. For you know, maybe you don't have motion sickness because you forgot you were traveling. No, it's not that bad. But you know, that can be an issue that is both good and bad in medicine. Good aspect of short-term memory block, the use of anti-muscarinic in surgical protocols for people to forget operation instruction. That's really good. But a bad aspect of this is the illicit use of anti-muscarinic to make someone else forget what they're about to undergo. Maybe rape, maybe robbery. And uh, anti-muscarinic drugs, of course, have been very much in use, uh, used in drug facilitated sexual assault. Scopolamine is one of them. Other drugs for anti-muscarinic that are used primarily in the CNS will be in Parkinson. Now, Parkinson disease will extensively review it with the neuroanatomy in the CNS section. So I would just like you to know today that drugs such as benztropine, and you see tropine right here for atropine, but also horrible names like trihexyphenidyl are anti-muscarinic drugs that are primarily used for Parkinsonism. They're also used for the acute extrapyramidal symptoms that are induced by certain antipsychotics. So quite relevant because they're lipid soluble and in the CNS. Finally, anti-muscarinic drugs can very much be used for people who have constant need, constant urgency to pee. You know, some people have a very strong bladder spasm, very loose fingers, and they tend to have a urinary incontinence because of this. Then anti-muscarinic drugs can help with urinary retention. Drugs like oxybutynin, polterodin are very much used for this. Dicyclamine, the final anti-muscarinic in this table, is actually used for irritable bowel syndrome to try and decrease peristalsis and cramping that might occur in those patients. You notice then, all of this flows naturally because you know where muscarinic receptors are located and what they do for a living. And that's what I meant by first work, the actual receptors, where they are and what they do, long before you bother your memory with drug names. Because the drug names are pure memorization. Sometimes you have a hint because of the way the drug is. If chemists had always done this to us, we'd love chemists. Right now, I'd like to kill them because, frankly, look at what they've given us. Drugs like cyclopentolate, dicyclomine, oxybutin, and polterodin. And you're looking at this, or well, you know, maybe it's someone's name in a different country than ours. So really, then it means nothing. Meaning your limiting factor in learning farm now is once you have a good understanding of the physiology, biochemistry of receptors and what they do, well, unfortunately, there is a pure memorization step, which is you need to have the correct vocabulary that comes with a drug. And a drug comes with a label. And that label is not what it's used for. It's not its side effect. It's the receptors it points to. And if you then understand the receptors and know the receptors the drug points to, I defy you not to be able to answer the board-like question. Very briefly, nicotinic receptor pharmacology. Nicotinic receptors are ligand-gated ion channels. Now, all ligand-gated ion channels share a similar structure. If G-protein-coupled receptors had seven transmembrane domains, ligand-gated ion channels are made of five subunits. Amongst the five subunits, two of them will be called alpha. And an alpha subunit, by definition, is one that is bound to by the endogenous neurotransmitter. If there are two alpha subunits, there must be two neurotransmitter molecules binding at a given time to open the channel. So as I'm looking at a nicotinic receptor, providing two acetylcholine molecules bind to the two alpha subunits, the channel opens. What are the ions that are involved? Well, the conductance is to sodium and potassium. And as sodium comes in, potassium leaves, the receptor activation results in depolarization, and depolarization is slightly associated with excitation of cells. There are two broad types of nicotinic receptors. We've already used the neuronal type, NN, that's found in the CNS, but also in ANS ganglia. Don't forget, it's also in the adrenal medulla linked to epinephrine release for the neuroendocrine system. And of course, the different nicotinic receptor you find in skeletal muscle that we call NM, M for muscle. Agonists of nicotinic receptors are few and far in between in medicine. 
You might wonder why. Well, you remember nicotinic receptors, they're very quickly desensitized. And if I work on a skeletal muscle, it means very quickly I would cause flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis means I can't breathe on my own. I need a ventilator in order to breathe. So what are neuromuscular blocking drugs that are truly agonists that work through desensitization? We'll see them in chapter 17 of this book, as particularly the drug succinylcholine. As a full agonist of nicotinic m type receptor, what we'll be after is the desensitization of these receptors to get flaccid paralysis. If you know succinylmethonium, succinylmethonium is just another example of full agonist of an M type of receptor. Only recently have we seen an N type of receptor agonist, and at this, only partial agonist at NN receptor. This is shown by the drug Vareniclin. Vareniclin is used for smoking cessation. Now, let's think about this. What's in smoke? Or rather, I should say, what's in tobacco that is strongly associated with the abuse potential? Be careful, not the cancer potential. The cancer potential are, of course, all the pyrogens of burning paper and tobacco. I'm talking about the CNS effect that we associate with the addiction, with the behavior of repeating the act of smoking. Well, it's, of course, what gave the name to the receptors, which is nicotine. When you're under the influence of nicotine, you can't stop smoking. You feel good with your cigarette, so there's no reason for you to stop. Or if you want to stop, because unfortunately, next to the nicotine are dozens of different carcinogens from the tobacco smoke. Well, it's tough. You can't use a blocker because you would get sudden withdrawal. And nicotine being a stimulant, the withdrawal would be depression. And depression would be severe enough as a negative reinforcement to tell you, oh, please, get back to smoking. Depression could be bad to the point of increasing the risk of suicide. So an antagonist would invariably cause depression and increase risk of suicide. So how about using varenicline, a partial agonist? A partial agonist in presence of my cigarette nicotine will behave as a blocker. So although it will have a potential increased risk of suicide and depression, it is not so likely because there will be a ceiling effect. This said, anyone who takes varenicline should be warned that if they feel funny and they have some weird thoughts about committing suicide, they should immediately stop taking varenicline. Otherwise, the big reason why they stop smoking is because they killed themselves. So, no well varenicline, a partial agonist of nicotinic neuronal receptor. We'll revisit this drug when we see other modalities to stop smoking in the CNS section. Now, as I leave nicotinic receptor agonist behind, how about nicotinic receptor blockade? In the blockade of nicotinic receptor, there would again be two groups, the one that block at the ganglion, the one that block at the skeletal muscle. And here, if we start with ganglionic blocking agents, we're looking at antiquated drugs that really have little, if any, clinical usage in the 21st century. But these drugs have commonly been on my step one. They are the drugs hexamethonium and mecamelamine. Why are they on the exam? Possibly to help you understand what would happen if you shut down the autonomic nervous system. My favorite is the third bullet point. Ganglionic blockers are found on step one because, in theory, they prevent all baroreceptor reflex changes in heart rate. Remember, they're not used clinically because of toxicity, but they will be used on USMLE for ANS problems. Let's work out a little bit a classic algorithm based on the use of ganglionic blockers and baroreceptor reflexes. What you're seeing in the diagram is heart tissue versus a blood vessel. Heart tissue, you know, may have beta-1 receptors for sympathetic to increase the heart rate, musculinic M2 receptors for parasympathetic to decrease the heart rate. If a drug directly works on a beta-1 or a musculinic receptor, stimulating it to cause tachy or bradycardia respectively on beta-1 or M2, you'd be hard-pressed by adding a ganglion blocker. You cannot prevent the drug from binding to beta-1 and cause tachycardia, or binding to M2 and cause bradycardia. So ganglionic blocking drugs, they can never prevent the changes in heart rate that are directly caused by beta or musculinic agonists. It means if I saw a tracing and a drug X was causing bradycardia, and I added now to this drug X hexamethonium or mecamelamine, and I still saw bradycardia, then I know the bradycardia is due to the drug and not due to a reflex. It's a direct effect of the drug. You contrast. What if the drug was truly not working in the heart, but the drug was actually vasoconstricting? Vasoconstriction would increase blood pressure. That blood pressure change would stimulate baroreceptors. Baroreceptors would tell my CNS, hey, my blood pressure just suddenly shot up. Can you please turn on your parasympathetic to cause reflex bradycardia? Now, you see as well as I do on this diagram, for parasympathetic to cause reflex bradycardia, you must cross the ganglionic synapse. The ganglionic blocking drug would not prevent the vasoconstrictor from vasoconstricting and raising blood pressure. But a ganglionic blocking drug would prevent the reflex bradycardia caused by the vasoconstrictor. Of course, the same would apply with a vasodilator. A vasodilator would drop the blood pressure. Baroreceptors would be silent. Only key difference, when baroreceptors are silent, sympathetic would predominate on the heart, causing a reflex tachycardia. Well, that reflex tachycardia can never reach the heart if you block the ganglion. So a ganglionic blocking drug will always prevent reflex changes in heart rate that are caused by vasoconstriction or by vasodilation. You see the key difference then? The whole idea will be to check out, does the ganglionic blocker change the heart rate response of the drug? If it does, it was due to a reflex. If it doesn't, the change in heart rate was due to the drug and not the reflex. Well, more to come on this, particularly in our next section on adrenergic pharmacology. At a Botox party on Miami Beach, a 48-year-old wrinkled lady was administered too much of a toxin and developed other signs of botulism. Which response is most likely? Would it be accommodation, hypertension, peristalsis, pupillary constriction, or tachycardia that would be expected in someone with too much botulism? In someone with too much botulinum toxin. Press the pause button. I'll meet you in a few seconds. If I was to draw a synapse with acetylcholine being released in the synaptic cleft before acetylcholine could bind to muscarinic or nicotinic type of receptors, I would remember that what botulinum toxin does is to prevent the release of acetylcholine in that synapse. Hence, by preventing acetylcholine release in the synapse, indirectly, indirectly, there will be less nicotinic stimulation, less muscarinic stimulation. So the whole idea behind the question on Botox is to show you that Botox will decrease the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, very much so by decreasing acetylcholine release in muscarinic synapses. Importantly, I'm going to say, but also decrease sympathetic autonomic nervous system, and that would be at nicotinic synapses of ganglia. Since we call 
Whether I'm looking at parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, I need to cross the ganglionic synapse using acetylcholine and nicotinic neuronal type of receptors. Essentially, on Botox, there is no more ANS. So the whole idea is what was predominant in your body's control of vegetative function. Where parasympathetic is predominant, Botox will cancel those parasympathetic presentations. Where sympathetic is predominant, Botox will result in no more of that sympathetic presentation. You know that when it comes to accommodation, this is purely under parasympathetic control. Because there is decreased parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, there wouldn't be accommodation, but rather the lack of accommodation, what we call cycloplegia. That would result in blurred vision, incapability of focusing for near vision. I know that when it comes to blood vessels, sympathetic predominates. Sympathetic, quite relevantly, is important for vasoconstriction. The lack of sympathetic then would not cause hypertension, but rather decrease the blood pressure. There would be some cardiovascular collapse in someone with severe botulism. When I look at the gastrointestinal or the GU tract, parasympathetic again predominates, and the lack of parasympathetic means there would be decreased peristalsis. There would be also absent not only movement, MVT for movement, but also importantly, if you put a stethoscope on your patient's belly, bowel sounds, decreased parasympathetic activity. The iris is primarily under parasympathetic control, and it does mean that with less parasympathetic predominance, I should see pupillary dilation. So I should see mighty dilated pupil. Now, be careful, this is not because of excess sympathetic. It's literally because normally parasympathetic predominates and maintains our pupils small enough, of course, to prevent bright light from injuring the retina or causing some temporary blindness. What would be key to me is that dilated pupil would be unresponsive to light. You can shine as much light to that eye, it will not constrict. And further, you could put your patient in darkness, it would not dilate any further. You have what we call fixed pupil. No more ANS to allow pupil uh, to allow pupil changes, pupil size changes. So we left obviously with the correct answer, aren't we? It's tachycardia. And indeed, once again, we have decreased parasympathetic, which means decreased pacemaker activity, which means an increase in heart rate. Now that tachycardia, keep in mind, it's also fixed. If your patient was asked to relax and not do any exercise, the heart would not slow down. There's no more parasympathetic. And at the same time, if you were putting that person on a treadmill, that tachycardia would not increase further because there's no sympathetic either. You've lost the modulation of vegetative responses when you have both dogs. Now between you and I, None of this is likely to kill you, but it's certainly giving you a very unique picture of botulism type of intoxication. I would like you to tell me one spot where that same botulism toxin could potentially compromise your respiration. And I'm sure you're thinking like me at the level of an end plate junction, at the level of the skeletal muscle synapses, where we have nicotinic M for muscle type of receptors. And there, the lack of stimulation by acetylcholine will cause muscle paralysis. How are you going to be able to mechanically ventilate if your diaphragm, if your intercostal scalene, so accessory muscles of respiration are not functional? What is really deadly of botulinum toxin is going to be the respiratory paralysis that follows the intoxication. Another story I want you to have ready for botulinum toxin is what drugs would really look like someone under the intoxication of botulinum? Look, if instead of decreasing acetylcholine, you were blocking those synapses at the ganglia with drugs like hexamethonium or mecamelamine, you would give a picture identical to that of Botox. To illustrate this, if you're not too sure what Botox would look like, I would refer you to Table 4-32A, Characteristics of Ganglion Blocking Agents. And really, you could have changed that title and decide characteristics of botulinum intoxication would have fit perfectly at this spot. Of course, it depends on who predominates in that system as to what is the overall effect of blocking ganglia. Parasympathetic by far predominates throughout the body except in the vasculature and in sweat glands. Yet in sweat glands, don't be fooled, it's sympathetic cholinergic that tends to control sweating. So it's still acetylcholine and muscarinic receptors in the end. But for arterioles and veins, really, there's solely sympathetic innovation. Sympathetic will tend to maintain constriction of the vessels. So if I shut down sympathetic activity, I expect to see vasodilation with hypotension from the arteriolar side, venodilation with decreased venous return and decreased cardiac output from the venous side. And of course, from the sweat glands, lack of sweating and hydrosis. Everywhere else, parasympathetic predominates. So removing the parasympathetic effect will be what I see when I use a ganglionic blocker. It means when it comes to the heart, my heart rate will increase, since parasympathetic promotes a slower heart rate to match better time for filling. It means at the level of the iris, I'll see dilated pupil. And do understand, those dilated pupil and tachycardia are very different from an antimuscarinic in that these are effects that are fixed. You no longer have ANS. That midriasis is no longer going to get more dilated in darkness or constricted because you shine a pen light in your patient's eye. It's just an unresponsive tissue. At the level of the ciliary muscle, there'll be no spasm of accommodation with cycloplegia. At the level of the GI and GU tract, there'll be decreased tone, decreased motility with constipation, urinary retention. And obviously at the level of all glands except sweat glands, there would be decreased secretion with decreased parasympathetic activity, so maybe dry mouth. Huh? Well, if you were tested on this table, you were just tested on the classic pharmacology. For new muscular blocking drugs, we're going to see them in chapter 17 with anesthesia. They are QRE like drugs, and if there was one thing we saw in this chapter, it's the fact that acetylcholine esterase inhibitors such as neostigmine could be used to reverse the neuromuscular blockade. So don't forget it, even if you do anyway. I'll put it back in your brain when we see chapter 17. At the end of the page, you see your first drug summary. And as a drug summary, I warned you that I've painted in bright red in your book the drugs that you must know. As you look at these drugs, what I do want you to do then is try and quiz yourself. Use it as your flashcard approach. Flashcards are never as good as the ones you make for yourself. And remember, the approach of doing pharmacology from a flashcard is catastrophic and is bound to yield failure simply because there's only but so much you can purely seemingly memorize. So no, now you've seen the pharmacology of muscarinic receptors. Do you remember what methacholine, bethanacol, palocarpine would do? I'm hoping you're thinking, oh yeah, cardiovascular would be decreased, smooth muscle contraction would be increased, all secretions would go up, and then start building the information just by looking at these drugs. If you realize you forgot it by looking at these red drugs, or they might be useful the side effect, by all means you're not done with the chapter. Go back to the information and review it again. Until ultimately, the day before your exam, 
All you're left with doing is flash back these tables in front of your eyes, and boom, you'll come right away with, oh, that's right, the muscular antagonist, and immediately you'll correlate that red drug with all the classical points that could be board tested. Now, if you want to be perfect, know the other drugs. You remember, Sevimelin was only working on which receptor? I know most of you, if not all of you, are telling me M3, M3 receptors. Huh? And absolutely, we used it in Sjogren's disease, you remember, for dry mouth. Astrocoinasterase inhibitors, I'm sorry, all of them are red. Well, that's because they're all board testable. Huh? In muscarinic antagonists, you see no well atropine, the atropium for COPD, scopolamine for motion sickness, benzcopine for Parkinson, and so forth. So use these summary tables pretty well. And as it's the first time, well, underneath the table, drugs in red need to be memorized. They said drugs in black would be good to know. You are now familiarized with muscarinic agonists and blockers, nicotinic agonists and blockers, and you also know well indirect acting drugs such as astiocoinesterase inhibitors with the issue of reversible and irreversible enzyme inhibitor. I hope you paid also good attention at the end of this chapter to the actual diagram that refers to the bowel receptor reflex algorithm, since as we embark in a comparison with the adrenergic nervous system, we will use that diagram very readily to understand where the heart rate changes are due directly to a drug, remember, in this situation again the only blocker would not affect the actual drug's response on the heart rate, or whether heart rate change was purely the result of a bowel receptor reflex, in which case the ganglionic blocking drug is going to cancel this reflex. This is so classically used in USMLE questions dealing with the ANS that it's critical at this point that you've understood that algorithm. Otherwise, I'm hoping also that by the end of this chapter, you are comfortable with the idea of representing drugs simply as a site of action mechanism. And that would be, I've been referring to the very beginning of this chapter, whereby another classic board question is to give you a stem and then place the stem with where the drug works on a diagram. So of course, for cholinergic synapses, place the drug according to pre or postsynaptically on the enzyme on the receptors.